Um, and then I'd like to start our introduction for our speaker with a land acknowledgement, as we do each Wednesday. Here, here the archaeological research facility is located in Puichin, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native and Indigenous peoples, both not just our words, but our actions. So today, We'll be having a, a talk uh, on Neanderthals um, with um, Dr. Lawrence Scoff, uh, who's a postdoctoral research in the Morjani Labe and, uh, Lab in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology here at UC Berkeley. He did his PhD uh, in bioinformatics at our house, and he developed a method for detecting Neanderthal and Denosovan ancestry in modern humans without using the archaic reference genomes and used it to find archaic segments in 27,000 Icelanders and 89 Papuans. His postdoc in Ben Porter's group, Ben Peters' group, sorry, at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, where he further studied archaic introgression in ancient genomes and studied Neanderthal communities. In the Morjani lab, he's focused on studying archaic introgression in South Asian populations and the evolution of human germline mutation rate. So please join me in welcoming him to our brown bag talk today. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for attending this talk. So, so my name is Lawrence, and thank you for the introduction. And today I'm gonna talk to you about what I did my postdoc uh, my postdoc work, which is from the Max Planck uh, Institute in Leipzig. And this work is all about the Neanderthal community and what we can learn from, from doing a genetic al analysis of 13 Neanderthals from two sites in, in the Altai Mountains. And so I'm going to do it a bit in reverse because there's no way I could have done all this by myself. And I had a lot of help from a lot of very uh, talented people. So I want to acknowledge all of them up front. So the way I'm going to structure my talk is as follows. First, I hope you can, can you read everything all right? Okay, good. So first we're going to talk about, we need some context first. So first of all, what do we know about Neanderthal communities up until this point? Then I'm going to introduce these two caves, the Giskaya cave and Oklatnikov cave and how they fit into all of this. And then as this is a genetic study, we're going to have to do a little genetics reminder, just so everyone is on the same page. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to jump into the results. So without further ado, let's get, let's get into it. So the first question is, what do we know about Neanderthal communities? So in the past 12 years, uh, researchers from, from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig have managed to sequence 18 Neanderthals from 14 different sites. This is the the work that awarded uh, Svante Pavo his Nobel Prize a couple of weeks ago. So you can see these are all the places where we sequence Neanderthals. And you can see the sort of spread out over the Neanderthal range. So you believe they live mainly in Europe, but also as far as east as, uh, as the Altai Mountains in Siberia, which is all the way over here. And it's where the two caves I'll be talking about today are located. So even though we have a lot of Neanderthal genomes now, the issue is that it's typically only a single individual per site. And, and you know, these sites were occupied from 120,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. So it's really quite spread out in time and space. So at this point, we don't really have a good idea of what a Neanderthal community looks like. Um, there has been some previous studies looking into this. Um, so for instance, there was a study from Spain where they sequenced uh, 12 individuals, but I, I say sequenced, they, they, they looked at four positions in, in the entire genome. Um, and from this, they can conclude that there was at least 12 individuals in a little community, and them, they might also have some hints about the social structure. Um, then there was another study. This is not uh, a genetic study, but this study looked at fossilized footprints that, you, that they found on a, 
on a beach in, in France. And from that, you can sort of also get an idea of how many individuals were in a community. So they also estimate something like 10 to 13 individuals in a community. Um, but you see our, our image is not, our resolution is not very high yet. Uh, which brings us to uh, uh, this paper with the Chakiska and Oklatnikov cave. And by the way, I forgot to say in the beginning, this talk is going to be around 30 minutes. So I have time for questions. And I prefer that you ask questions while I'm going through the talk. I feel like that flow is better. I don't know if that's how you usually do it. Great. Yeah. So if you have any question, feel free to interrupt and ask your question. Yes. So now we're zooming in on Chagiska and Oklatnikov cave. And you can see that it's all the way here in southern Siberia on the border with Kazakhstan in Russia. And these are the two caves marked here. And you might notice that they're very close to the famous Denisova cave, which is where the, we first found a, a bone from a Denisova, which is another type of, of human like the Neanderthals that lived here. So, First, I'm going to go through each cave. And, and now we're sort of in the, in, not in my area of expertise. This is the, the archaeology. But I'll, I'll bear with me. I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to summarize uh, the important things. So the Kiskaya cave uh, has been excavated since 2007. The excavation is still going on. And at this point, around 30% of the cave has been excavated, um, which has already yielded around 80 Neanderthal bones and teeth. And you can see some of them here. Some of them in red eye are from this study. And so the important thing about this cave is that we think the occupation was short. So if you do optical dating of sediments, if you do radio and carbon dating, um, it all points to the occupation being, you know, between 50 and 60,000 years ago. And so there's only one layer, this layer six, I don't know if you can see that, where this is where we find all the Neanderthal remains. It's also where we find all the bison bones that they were hunting and eating. And it's also where we find all the lithics. Um, so we think it's a relatively short occupation. And by that, I mean over a couple thousand of years max. Um, and it happened somewhere between 50 and 60,000 years ago. Now for Oklatnikov cave, the story, is, uh, the story is quite different, unfortunately. So that was excavated in the 80s. Um, and as you can see before, with Chakiska cave, we know exactly where each remain comes from, what layer it comes from. But here we don't. Oh, yeah. Can I just ask a question about the previous date? You can. So everything is in layer six. Yeah. Are they articulated burials or disarticulated bones ripped out there? Uh, it's not burials. Uh, and can, can you specify what you mean? So, like, so the bones are spread all we're over. We're not talking about skeletons laid out in articulation. We're talking about random. Yes, bones. yes, yeah. yes. Exactly. So most of these things are actually quite small. So we have teeth and we have small pieces of bones. We don't have a big uh, femur, for instance, or a skull or anything like that. Um, yeah, so there was the Giska cave, which looks nice, but Oklatnikov, we don't know so much about, unfortunately. So it's excavated, but as far as I understand, everything was taken out of the cave, and then we, we were going through all the sediments, so we don't know exactly where the bones are from. Um, and the dating here is also more tricky, so we only have a minimum age here, so older than 45,000 years ago. Yes, in the back. Um, since there was mostly fragmentary intercranial remains recovered, like, did it take a while for people to determine that these weren't actually bones? Um, I think quite quickly in most of the caves, they knew it was Neanderthals because they found some teeth that had some characteristic Neanderthal remains. But I think the bones. Uh, I think that zooms, like where you can you can like scan through a lot of bones and, and look for for human proteins. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the takeaway here, Chikiskaya has uh, more <laughs> accurate dating than Oklatnikov, and also more information. And also, coincidentally, the DNA preservation is also much better in Chikiskaya cave than Oklatnikov cave. So. You will see me in this talk mainly focusing on Chakiska cave. It's just because that's where we have the most, the most data from. Uh, another thing that, that you need to know is that the tool industry, in the stone tool industry in Chakiska cave and Oklatnikov cave are very similar. They are called the Sabiyachika variant. This particular type of variant is different from other sites 
in the Altai Mountains. Like, so only these two caves uh, and another site has this one. And it's actually very similar to a stone tool industry that's seen in Europe. So that led researchers, uh, a little our Russian collaborators, to suggest that it actually looks like there's been multiple Neanderthal migrations from Europe and into Siberia. The first one being something like 100,000 years ago. And that's the one, that's the, that the population where the first high cover Neanderthal genome comes from. That comes from this first one. Um, and then a second one, somewhere around 60,000 years ago, because they have the similar uh, tool industry. So this is a, was that a hand? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this is a case where uh, the hypothesis of multiple migration actually comes from archaeology first. And then the same year, it was actually uh, confirmed also using genetics. So there is one high coverage nanotile already from secrets from Chekhiskaya cave. And this individual also shows that these Neanderthals are more like the European Neanderthals than they are uh, the other Neanderthals that live in Siberia. So that's, so that's sort of the background of the case. Is there any questions at this point? I see no questions. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to do a quick genetics reminder. So I, I know you, all of you probably know this, but it's always good to have a little refresher. So this is what our genomes look like. You can see we have 23 chromosome pairs. All the autosomes are labeled 1 until 22. And then you also have the sex chromosomes. And the most common constellations is XX, then you are uh, female, and XY, then you are male. And then in addition to this, we also have this mitochondria, uh, which is sort of a little piece of circular DNA in our bodies that generates all the energy in our bodies. So if you hold your breath, you, you won't be using your mitochondria because it runs on oxygen. So it, actually, it is quite important. Um, one thing that's going to come back later, I'm just saying it now, but I will say it again later, is so each, you inherit a, a chromosome from each of your parent. Uh, but there's something special about some of them. So for the Y chromosome, that's a chromosome that's only inherited from the father to the son. And this little mitochondria, this little powerhouse of the cell, is only inherited from mother to children. And then only the daughter will, will then pass it on. Uh, and then, so, so each chromosome is just a long sequence of, of base pairs. Um, and there's four different types of bases. So we have an A, C, and a G, and a T. And the data we look at as geneticists looks something like this. Imagine a giant sex file with 3.2 billion letters in it. And that, that would be our data. So yeah, again, one chromosome you get from your mom and, and one you get from your dad. So, so, so that's quite a lot of data, but we're zooming in on specific things. So each time uh, you, you get your, your parents pass DNA onto you, uh, they copy the DNA and, and pass it on. But this DNA copying machinery is not perfect. And sometimes there will be mistakes. And that's actually quite good for us because that's what we use to differentiate different individuals and find out who's related to who. Um, so on average, each of you here in this room will probably have something like 75 mutations that no one else in this room have that is being passed on from your parents. Um, so these are the, the signals that we're using. So you can imagine the more uh, related you are to someone, the less differences you will have. So I try to illustrate that here with so this is our data. We have this long sequence of letters, and, and sometimes there's differences. You can see there's a C here, and there's a G here, and this other individual. And then, yeah. So if, if, you know, if, if I have a brother in the room with, you know, there are 75 differences between us? Or... Yes. Okay, just that. Well, <laughs> some of them might be shared, but a majority are actually not. Uh, and mutations you can mainly thank your father from, by the way. 75% of them come from the maternal, uh, uh, the paternal line, sorry. Yeah. Yes, so, so now we have the, the setup. So we have uh, few differences means you're close related and, and more differences means you're more distantly related to each other. So the data we look at here is we take the entire genome and, and we look at positions that we know are already uh, varying in population. So we don't, we don't look at the entire thing. 
But if we look at something like 700,000 positions, then we look at uh, 7 million positions on the Y chromosome, and we look at the entire mitochondria. But the mitochondria is small, so it's only 15,000 letters that we have to look at. And so that's our data. Uh, so now that's, so, so we, we take all our bones and we extract DNA from them. And so this is all the individuals that we could get DNA from. And I listed them here with, this is the, the ID of the, of the domain. And most of them are from the Gaia cave. And then only a few are from the Gaia cave. Uh, another thing is that here you can see which element it is. So there, this is a little tooth symbol. That means that it comes from a tooth. And if not, it comes from, comes from a bone. And then we can also determine the genetic sex of the individual. And so because sometimes these teeth are deciduous, like the first one, for instance, is an example of a deciduous tooth, we can sort of estimate how old were this individual, uh, not at the time of death, but at the time where you lose this teeth. Uh, so you can see this age estimate here. Sometimes there's a D, and that means that it's a deciduous tooth. So it's not time of death. It's time of losing this, this tooth. Um, and some of them I want to highlight already. So we very quickly discovered that one individual, this Takis guy 12 here, is actually the same individual as the previous high coverage Takis guy I told you about earlier. So it's the same individual represented by two, two remains, one tooth and, and one bone. <coughs> then we have another interesting example here. This is another case where archaeologists were pretty confident that this was probably coming from the same individual, these two bones because one is a mandible and the other is an incisor that fits perfectly into that mandible. Uh, so they already had a pretty good suggestion that this was the same individual. Uh, and we'll see if we can confirm that with, with genetics. Uh, yes, so let's jump into how are all these fragments of bones, like the individuals that they come from, how are they related to each other? So just to get you ready for the type of plot I'm going to show you in a bit, let, let's, let, let's imagine that we have a father and a mother and we have a son and a daughter. Like, so we have a little family, and then we have some individual that's not immediately related to, to any of them. Uh, but we only have data from the red ones, the son, the daughter, and, and the unrelated. So if we compare them to each other, we're going to see that, so if we compare the, uh, in the, like the unrelated individual to itself, it's going to be identical. It's going to be the same sequence. And, and the same if you compare the daughter to herself and the son to himself. But the more interesting thing is what when we compare them to each other. So you can see that the daughter and the son, they're going to have a first degree relationship. Whereas this unrelated individual is going to yeah, not be related, have an unrelated relationship to both of them. Does this uh, make sense? Yes. So now let's do it on our data. And, and this is what it looks like. So you can actually see that you see a lot of gray, first of all. So you see that most of these individuals that we find are not related to each other. Uh, but there are little clusters here and there. So we take the first one. This is Tekis guy 6 and Tekis guy 14. And that was the tooth and mandible that I told you about earlier that fit together and was suspected to be the same individual. And that is blue, so that is identical. This, these two remains come from the same individual. We have another case here where we have uh, three teeth, all from the same individual. What's a bit interesting is that, so one of the teeth are deciduous and the other two are permanent. So, so we were already very excited that, ah, you know, can you say something about Neanderthals coming back to the cave, returning to the cave and, and keep on being there. But as it turns out, if you estimate how old would this individual have been, um, it, it's very possible this is just one event. So the individual loses a tooth and then dies shortly after. So we cannot make any claims about the Neanderthals having a favorite cave or, or something like that. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this teeth, like, so, you know, if you have a kid, their their deciduous tooth is sitting in the mouth for like two weeks before it actually like comes out. And yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so now let's turn to, we actually find a first degree relationship too, which is very interesting. It's the first one ever recorded between a pair of Neanderthals. Well, of course they existed, but the first time we have the DNA from it. So it's a, it's a male and a female. And there's like three different ways uh, 
a first degree relationship could be. Like these two individuals could be siblings, they could be brother and a sister, they could be mother and son, or they could be father and a daughter. Um, but you remember earlier I told you about the mitochondria and how this was inherited only from mother to children. So let's think about what that would look like. We have mitochondria data for these individuals too. So if the mitochondria, uh, if it's a brother and a sister, then the mitochondria will be the same because they're both inherited from the mother. And if it's a mother and son, then the mitochondria will also be the same because again, in the mother, it, it, the son is inherited from the mother. But if it's a father and daughter, they could be different or they could also be the same. But luckily for us, they are different. So we can actually, we're confident and say like, these two individuals are first degree related and it's a father and his daughter. The daughter is a teenage daughter and the father is an adult male. I think that's very exciting because that sort of means we go from, from something like this, these are, the, these are the remains, to be able to say, you know, something like this, like to paint relationships of the NSRs. And I want to give credit to Tom Bjorklund, who's an amazing, art, amazing artist who's, who's drawing all these things for us. So this is a summary of how all the individuals in our cave are related. So these big uh, squares would be males and the circles would be females. And the, the letters indicate individual names and all the specimens that come from the same individual will be these little circles in here. So you can already see that we have a father daughter. We also have a second degree relationship that I didn't tell you about because we cannot say that much about that. That can be a a uh, cousin pair that could be a grandmother and a, so, a grandson, or it could be uncle, niece, or aunt, nephew. It can be many things. So we cannot say that which one it is. Yeah. But you already see that some of these individuals are related to each other. So this was probably the same Neanderthal community. This is like a snapshot of a community, uh, consistent with the occupation of this cave being, being very short. So, so now that we have a community, what can we actually say? What can we actually say about it? Um, and there's two, two main points we can make. And one of them is how big, how large is this community? And how large is the population that this community comes from? And another thing we can say something about a social organization, but let's start with just the size of this community. So I'm again like prepping you for this plot that I'm about to show you. So we have each individual on the x-axis and the y-axis is something called homozygosity. It means how many times is the DNA from your parents the same? And if that happens all the time, then you have very low diversity and a small population size. But if homozygosity is low, that means there's a lot of diversity and a larger population size. So that looks like this. Don't worry so much about what the different colors mean yet, or what different shades, sorry. The colors are blue is for Neanderthals and Denisovans. And orange is for early modern humans, modern human hunter together, something like 40,000 years ago. And what you can already see here is that there's more homozygosity in the Neanderthals. And this means that Neanderthals lived in smaller communities than modern humans. There's less genetic diversity in them. So, so another question could be, so this is comparing to, to ancient uh, modern humans, but what if we compare to modern humans today? And what if we zoom even further out and compare to our closest uh, relatives who are alive today? So the, the great age, you can see gorillas and orangutans and stuff like that. So then we get something like this. So I collapsed all the Tikiskaya into one bar and just put some error bars on so you can see what the average is. And you can obviously see that the homozygosity is way higher than the other individuals. And by the way, some people call this inbreeding too, but I don't think that's a nice term. That's, that's something maybe for like animal breeding and like these are humans, so we shouldn't use that term. So you can see that modern day human populations are all these here, and they have much more diversity. They have much less homozygosity compared to the Anatars. And actually the, the population that the Anatars look most like are these green ones, which are mountain gorillas. And so this is not to say that Neanderthals live like mountain gorillas or anything like that. This is only a how big is the community. And so the mountain gorillas, as you might know, are, is an endangered species and there's less than a thousand individuals alive of this species today. So think of like, so we are analyzing Neanderthals something like 10,000 years before they go extinct, like all the way uh, to the easternmost uh, range of their habitat and it's a small population. So 
there's not a lot of individuals around is, is what this shows us. Uh, and then the last thing, so now we talked about how big the community is, but let's talk about how these communities are related to each other. So, and the way we're gonna do that is, so I should say that, first of all, we know that you cannot just have a community of 10 individuals constant through time, because sometimes just by chance, you will only have sons and then you will go extinct. You cannot get more children. So you need these communities to interact with each other. Um, and then the question we want to ask is, well, so how are these communities interacting with each other? Is, is it mainly women who are moving between communities or is it more the men or both who are moving between these communities? And I'm gonna illustrate this with little cartoons here. So imagine we look at the mitochondria. That was the thing I said before that that's inherited from mother to uh, children, but only passed through the daughter. So this is gonna be a history of the maternal line uh, of women in, in, in these communities. And I've drawn little communities here. I have four communities, each of them have some individuals in. And these are the DNA sequences these, these squares represent. And if you're gray, then, then you're all the same. But you can imagine that in each community, mutations will happen because the machinery is not perfect. And then you get differences. So I colored them in, in, in different colors here. Uh, but we only have DNA from one community. We only have DNA from the Chagiskai community. So what I'm setting up here is that I'm doing a lot of computer simulations. Like all these little communities live inside my computer and then they interact and I track them through time. And then we can see what scenario fits best with the data we are having. So, so there was the mitochondria. So we can compare that, the mitochondria diversity to the white chromosome diversity. So you can imagine if there's no movement between communities, then all the diversity in the this guy community that we're looking at should be more or less the same compared to the white chromosome diversity, if there's no movement or if they're, if they're moving at the same rate. But you can maybe also imagine different scenarios. So you could imagine that the female are moving between groups. And here, what I want you to notice is that, so for instance, in this community here, there's now some, some uh, orange mutations from, from, from this uh, community here, and there's some green ones from over here and some blue ones from here. But there's still just the purple ones in the white chromosome. So if women are moving, you will get more different types of mitochondria if you just look at one population because they come from other places. And vice versa, if you have the men moving between the different communities, then there's gonna be low diversity on the mitochondria, but higher diversity on the Y chromosome. Does this make sense? Thanks. So now let, let's see in the data, what does it actually look like? So this is, so this is the data. We ha I have my these guys all the way here on the left. And then I have modern human populations uh, here on the right. So the first thing you can see is that this is the amount of diversity on the, on the y-axis. The first thing you can see that the bars are not very, very tall. So that means low diversity that's in the, in the Neanderthals. But that's good. That was, that was the same thing we found from, from before. So now if we zoom in, uh, the first bar here is the height of the mitochondria diversity. This is how much mitochondria diversity is there. And this one is how much Y chromosome diversity is there. Then I'm also compared to some other populations. But the important thing is there's much more y uh, mitochondria diversity than there's Y chromosome diversity. It's actually a factor of 10 times higher. So, so this suggests that it's mainly the women who are moving between these communities. And to, order to get an idea of, well, how much are they moving and how big are the communities, we, we set up all our computer simulations and we simulate a whole bunch of scenarios and we find the best fitting one. Uh, what is, oh, <laughs> I forgot I had this slide. This, this, is just, uh, this is just taking the, the, the difference in, in Y chromosome diversity minus mitochondrial diversity and, and, and looking at it. And if you are very negative, that means you have very high mitochondrial diversity. And if you're very positive, then you have very high Y chromosome diversity. That's just to show again that the these guys are, uh, yeah, again, more similar to, to the great apes, but they're more extreme than all present day human populations. So now that we, this is, so now we try all our different simulations. And what we find is that 
the best fitting scenario, keep, it, keep, it, keep in mind, this is a simple computer simulation where we have these communities and the videos are moving between them. It can never capture all the complexity of real life, but it's a good approximation. Um, and using this approximation, we find that these community sizes were small. So something like 10 to 20 individuals, which is consistent with all the archaeological literature on this. And it actually looks like that female are moving quite a, females are moving quite a lot between these communities. So we have something like between 50 and 100% of all the women in a community actually come from, from other communities. And even if you have male migration or if not, it, it doesn't make the model fit any better. So this is consistent with very low male mobility between these groups. Uh, yeah, and that was it. So just to sum up everything. So this is the first time we have DNA from an entire community of Neanderthals. And we look at the autosomes, we look at the mitochondria, and we look at the Y chromosome. And what we can learn from doing this is that this Neanderthal population was small. Uh, so a small community size and a small, and that has been small for a while. Um, and we also find that some individuals are related to each other. For instance, we have the father-daughter that I showed you about earlier. And so even though these communities are small, they're not isolated. So they do exchange migrants with each other and they're primarily linked by female migration is what our, our data suggests. And with that, I would like to thank you all for inviting me and thank you for listening. Historians have really watched the field change dramatically with all this ancient DNA work. <clears throat> and maybe people don't know, but Dominic Papa did his postdoc research here at Berkeley. Yes. It's really what got him started on this. It's where ancient DNA started. started. Yes. <laughs> so maybe you'll follow in line with that. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions, mostly about terminology. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the, the assumptions that go behind calling something a community. Yeah. Uh, and why that was chosen rather than a group or a selection or collection of options yeah, yeah. at a particular site. And the other term that I would like a little clarification is calling what is happening with mobile female migration, because that is yeah. another whole set of yeah. communication. So if you could say something about why community is justified yeah. and why migration or migrant. Yeah. Uh, which of course had a negative overtone. Uh, yes, day, yes, right? yes, yes. So, so let's do the community first. So this was actually like, because I come from genetics and we mainly call things groups or populations. Right. Um, but we settle on the term of community sort of to, to show that, so these are individuals who are living together is, is the reason why we use it, but like overlapping in time and in space. Um, and then we have a broader term population, which is more like this collection of communities. Are you happy with that uh, answer? Yeah, 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 I'm getting that. It was just the first part uh, yeah. of it. Yeah. So migrant, yes, that sort of implies going from somewhere to somewhere else. Um, so there's also, we also had a debate of, of what to call that because like, for some species, not humans, not great apes, but some other one, you also have migration. But is there intent between this migration? Um, and we sort of wanted to, uh, well, we don't know, but like, that probably was, like the NSL probably knew what, what they were doing. Uh, so we, we want the one with intent, the migration. The other one would be maybe more like diffusion or, or something like that. Well, I, I just want mobility gave more agency those women then thinking that they were migrants and they were having to escape ah, that's the way in which yeah that's true yeah that's true i didn't think of it like that that's a good point yeah. yeah 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 and that you know i think the other aspect of mobility um again suggests that what you don't have necessarily is a finite group that sticks together the whole oh, time yeah. Yeah. yeah that's one of the assumptions in that we're talking about in my modeling approach that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah anyway just um 
<laughs> no, it's, 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 it's very good point. This, this is, is for sure not a matter that's settled yet. Uh, it's just the, in the what our data indicates so far. Yeah, I think there was more. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It was a really, really interesting talk. Uh, um, we have a few kind of technical questions as I think through the implications of So if we go back to the relatedness analysis that you did, the aspect of like uh, brother, sister, mother, father, or mother, and her son, yeah. father, daughter. Mm -hmm. So what happens? And sorry, I haven't thought through this, so maybe this is a good question, but what happens when you have situations of um siblings who have different parents who might share a mother but not a father or a father but not a mother. Yeah. Then they will second degree. Okay. Like, second degree. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um and then the two cases that you look at, um, I am clear that you did not find any familial relationships between those two cases. Uh yes, there was no familiar relationship between them, but there's an interesting little extra piece of information here. So I did, I did tell you that Takiska gave me more sure about the dating. It's between 50 and 60,000 years ago, but we can't go we are not. But what we actually find is that there is a mitochondria version in Takiska cave that's identical to what one of the individuals in Oklaknikov cave has. So they have like the exact same DNA sequence. And that sort of means that, like, so how long can you have that without a mutation coming and changing it? And, and that's that you can have that for a couple, a couple of thousand years. years. So that means that you can actually sort of constrain the timing of the Kretnikov cave. It must have been inhabited within a couple of thousand years of Czechy Sky Cave. So this is greater than 45, probably closer to the 50 to 60,000. And then chronologically, how are these cases related to the older, correct? No, so uh, Denisova, there's been a whole study on that. That has been occupied for more, and I actually have to be the first author here in the room. Is it like 200,000 years? Over years. Years. From 55 years ago? No. So, uh, yeah. Yes. So that, that, that's, that's also a long complicated way. Well. You see these events being there and then the Andertals and then both of them and then modern humans in the end. But here we only see the Andertals. So there's no chronological no overlap? Yes, there, there is an overlap. So how does it work? Have you ever been able to look at any potential relationships? Uh, so now we're more into, so there are the Anatols and the Nusimans around in the Nusimans cave at this time. Uh, but we don't find any familiar relationship to, we, like, to any of the bones. <laughs> One more. Yeah. But of course, that's not always the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's more yeah, people who are living together. Right. Yeah. So, if we go back to the illustration that you had of the different circles that occupy these ones, uh, yeah. individual years, you said that you didn't find any sort of relationship between the Nusimans and the Nusimans. Yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, the isotope analysis and see do they actually do is there early childhood from this other cave or something like that that's something we wanted to do but then COVID happened and we couldn't go and and now there's there's a war so it yeah, yeah. It, it would it would have been nice to do though yes this is more of a broad-based question because you guys have done some amazing work and you know in terms of looking at all the <clears throat> the work you've done work you've done with the so how does this siberian yeah. how does it compare to these others that have been looked at by the institute in terms of just the genetic is there a similarity or is there a real difference I mean, can you really walk that and just get a yes. sense of just so i can end really or yeah, yeah. I can give you a two-part answer to that question. The first one is about the sizes of the communities. And it seems that there are more Neanderthals in Europe at this time than there are here in Southern Siberia. So the community size, but also their broader population size, that, uh, they have more genetic diversity. As comes from sort of the social organization, the, um, like, do they also show female mobility? Uh, there is. There, there was one of the studies I highlighted here in the beginning. There, there's this cave from Spain where they have these uh, four positions, like three on the mitochondria, one on the ribosome that they look at. And so what they find is that all the all the females have different mitochondria, but all the males have the same. It's a very small sample size, and there's a lot of issues with this study. But that actually suggests the same organization as what I'm suggesting: the female mobility. Uh, but I would say that, that it could be nice for some more data from this cave to really know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. So in those sense, yeah. And these are the two data points we have. We don't have the DNA from more, more communities. And is it the same over the hundreds of thousands of years that Amazon occupy Europe and across different places? We don't know. That would be interesting to see in the future. And a little spoiler is that there will be studies on that. In your future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, we already have a spot for you here when you're talking. <laughs> Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, not to break um, all of the statistics, when you're comparing the um, diversity. Um, in the end of all the that you have, yeah. with a whole array of other populations right up to very different quantities. Yeah. What role does sample size play in making those contrasts? Yeah. yeah. So the the amount of let's go to the homosexuality. I think yeah. that's your question. So the the amount of inbreeding, well, like lack of diversity. Let's call it that instead in the Anasals. Like, you never see these amounts in modern humans, like in present day living humans, like it's always much lower. Of, of course, if you had, uh, you only had, let's say you only have one individual from each, you're actually still lucky because the genome is not a unit, like, because there's something, I didn't talk about this, but the DNA you get from your parents is actually a mix of their two. It's like you, are, you have DNA from parents, but you actually have both your grandparents and then you have a quarter of your great grandparents. So there's actually a lot of, there's a lot of independent places in the genome. So even if you only have one genome, you can with pretty high accuracy say the, 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 the homozygosity in these two individuals is statistically different. So, it was a bit of a roundabout way of saying, uh, yes, we're sure <laughs> that the community is much smaller. Yes? So, just thinking about the long term sort of, I mean, referring to this case, I guess the father and the daughter being there would suggest that Where's they the died at the same time or that they came back. Uh, I, so, so we don't know, but I will say that uh, if I had the, the table, it would, yeah, yeah, I will say the most likely thing is probably that this is one event, and you you can if you look at the ages of some of the people, some of them died quite young, and so you can even imagine something like like life was hard back then, and you can sort of imagine that. Uh, it's just 
because of something that couldn't get enough heat or something, and, and then the individuals die in this case. Uh, I, I don't know what the answer is, but to me, that's the more likely one. Do the animal bones or lithics give any information about the Actually, like, it, it, it doesn't tell you us how they died, but it tells us what happened after that. So we have one of the one of the teeth. This I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yeah. Let's yeah, take this guy out here. That was very hard to work with because that tooth had been eaten by a hyena. So when we look at the DNA, ten percent of the DNA is hyena DNA, <laughs> which makes it, so it looked, that looked very different from all the other individuals. We're like, oh, this must be someone coming from far away or something. But then you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just makes of human DNA and hyena DNA. Um, so, but that doesn't say that they were killed by hyenas, but maybe post-mortem hyenas could come in the cave and dig around and, and eat them. Yes? Um, you can pass through that they seem to be really, um, from what I understand, we are thinking of marrying into the soul. Yeah. Well, uh, not marrying. We don't know if they had that kind of, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So maybe let me find one with arrows on, like this one. So when does the community sort of end and, and, and where does another one begin? So, so if you, you can maybe imagine that like these arrows go to 100%. That sort of means that these communities are one community. So we will not find 100%, but between 50 and 100%. So it does suggest that yeah, like these communities are very, very connected. And exactly where does one begin and where does one end? Uh, I can only say that the best fitting one suggests like this community size and with this level of connectedness, but you can tweak the parameters, you know. Other ones can also explain the data. Uh, but that's where it would be really nice to have, you know, more DNA, have a family and maybe do this isotope analysis too. But that also could explain why you have so much unrelatedness within one site. And it won't be until you start looking and comparing the screen sets. So actually, yeah. yes, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Maybe talking about it as a breeding community. Um, we like to think, you know, they get married, but you know, they're real. It's really a manifestation um, of, of interbreeding. Right? So maybe your community is, yes, perhaps social, but also perhaps um, more of a breeding community than. Uh, happy little yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, well, you know, we know that people live across the landscape as four hundred. You kind of come together and go apart, come together and go apart yeah. uh, throughout an annual cycle, and they're foraging on the yeah. landscape. So the moments of the of the cave collapse or whatever that yeah. that got these folks there. That, that was going to be, you know, a, a short time in their yeah. class cycle, and they might have come together as a larger, yeah. you know, moment and, yeah. and, and move actually quite fluidly among yeah. various different camps or something. And like can, I, can I add a little thing to that? That's, that's exactly right. And so, so, so most of the bones, most of what they were eating in these house is bison bones. So, so they were hunting bison. bison. And the bison are migratory. So they, they come to, the, to this area in a while. So we, we think this has only been occupied like in the time of year where bison is around. And some people also suggested that, you know, in some sites, there's just so many bison bones that in order to kill and butcher all these bones, it, like without all the meat going bad, you will need a lot of individuals. So perhaps that, that is what people, some people are arguing. Yeah, exactly that. All these communities come together to do something. 
maybe, maybe hunting, maybe, maybe something else. Yes, <laughs> all, all everything. Yeah, all of the above. Thank you for having me. And I will stop sharing.